All right, so um, now we go on with uh, manifolds and uh, fiber bundles. Um, first, again, some, some motivation and examples. Um, I think you all have uh, an intuitive understanding of what a manifold is. So we already heard about the topological manifolds as uh, spaces which are kind of locally isomorphic uh, to Euclidean spaces. And here are some examples. Um, for instance, the Euclidean space itself is a manifold. Um, then a sphere is a manifold. Uh, since if you look at the local patch and you would cut out the local region, it would uh, look like a flat two-dimensional space, like a region of the Euclidean space if you stretch it down. Um, meshes would be a discrete version of two-dimensional manifolds. Um, Space-time is obviously a manifold. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also uh, Lie groups are actually uh, smooth manifolds. So for instance, if you have uh, SO2, uh, the rotation group in two dimensions, you can think about it as uh, having all angles from zero to two pi and uh, at two pi, they connect back together. So topologically SO2 as a group looks like a circle, uh, which is a manifold. Or uh, if we have the direct product of SO2 times SO2, that's uh, topologically uh, just a torus, uh, which is S1 times S1. So the product of uh, two circles. Um, and yeah, as we already heard, uh, manifolds are kind of defined as uh, spaces which are locally Euclidean and uh, second countable Hausdorff. Um, and it means that around each point P on the manifold, uh, you could uh, cut out a neighborhood or you find a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to a Euclidean space or to a region of a Euclidean space. And why are we interested in it? There are many applications in deep learning. Um, for instance, uh, we could try to define convolutions on uh, more general spaces than Euclidean spaces, so convolutions on manifolds. Um, then Francesco, for instance, is working on uh, embeddings of data or more specifically graphs uh, in manifolds. So what you're seeing here are embeddings on uh, a torus or um, what people often do is uh, embedding graphs into hyperbolic spaces. Uh, which is useful since uh, if you have uh, if you have something like a tree, uh, then if, if you go down the tree, the number of nodes uh, scales exponentially. So with each level of the tree, you have exponentially more nodes. And um, if you would try to embed uh, such a tree or a graph into uh, a Euclidean space, you wouldn't have enough space there. Since uh, if you go out uh, on, let's say, spherical shells from the uh, center, then uh, the amount of space on the surface of this sphere just grows uh, polynomially with your radius. And uh, if you have something like a hyperbolic space, you actually also have an exponential scaling of this uh, area you have. So uh, you cannot really well embed uh, tree, tree-like graphs into um, Euclidean spaces, but it works much better in hyperbolic spaces. So there uh, are also um, many folds which are going in. Then you could be interested in uh, doing some optimization on manifolds. Uh, for instance, if you have, uh, if you want to optimize for the path which a robot arm is taking, then uh, you have only certain operations which this robot arm can take. Um, so, for instance, if I would rotate uh, here around my joint, then um, like the the point of my hand is, is moving on a manifold, uh, but it's it's not a point in in continuous uh, space. So you could do some optimization on manifolds and gradient descent. Or uh, you could look at uh, probability densities on a manifold. And uh, also, there, there are some papers which uh, describe normalizing flows, uh, which are deep learning models on manifolds. And finally, we are going to look at uh, fiber bundles, uh, which you can think of as uh, like a base space, for instance, a manifold. And then uh, you construct another space out of it by gluing a fiber to each point of that space. So for instance, if you have the circle as a base space and as a fiber, you have this interval, you can glue it to the circle in such a way that you get uh, a cylinder. But uh, if you glue at each point this fiber, but uh, connect it, if you go once around in such a way that you have this twist, you get out a Möbius strip. And uh, these spaces are um, defined as fiber bundles. And uh, yeah, for geometry, they're really important since if you have uh, the space of all or if you have the tangent spaces on a manifold, uh, they actually uh, define a vector bundle, the tangent bundle. So you attach a vector space to each point. Um, or we could also look at something like the frame bundle, which is the bundle of all reference frames at all points. Okay, um, yeah, I will start very shortly with uh, topological manifolds, um, but just give the idea since uh, Chris already talked about it. 
um, then, and then we will start to add more structure to these manifolds, which uh, Chris already uh, showed on this last slide. So first, uh, smooth structures, which uh, give you tangent spaces, and uh, they allow to um, define something like differentiation of uh, functions on the manifold. And uh, then we will add a Riemannian metric, which allows you to measure distances. And uh, yeah, in the end, I will come to fiber bundles. Okay, um, the definition of a topological manifold, we saw it already. Uh, it's, it's basically a topological space, which is uh, second countable and Hausdorff, which I didn't write down here uh, to simplify it a little bit. But um, yeah, if, if you have a topological space, uh, which is a d-dimensional manifold, uh, this means that around each point on the manifold, you find a neighborhood um, and a homeomorphism X from this neighborhood to uh, some corresponding open subset uh, or neighborhood in the uh, Euclidean space. Uh, yeah, and that thing is uh, called a coordinate chart. And if you have that property, that means uh, kind of that the manifold is at each point uh, d-dimensional. It looks like a d-dimensional uh, space. And uh, yeah, this, this is a local definition, but uh, globally, um, a manifold uh, is not necessarily homeomorphic to a Euclidean space, like this uh, sphere here. You can't, uh, or, or like, like the coffee mug, uh, you can't deform it into a flat Euclidean space. Only locally, it looks like that. Um, then we can define uh, something called an atlas, which is uh, just a collection of uh, charts in such a way that uh, if you take all these uh, neighborhoods, uh, of all the charts in your um, in your atlas, uh, and you take the union, they should cover the whole uh, manifold. And um, then you can look at uh, transition maps uh, between different charts. So if you have these two uh, neighborhoods, UA and UB here, they overlap here, they have this intersection. Then we have a chart XA, which maps UA to VA. And we have uh, this chart XB, which uh, also maps its region. And then you have here this corresponding overlapping region in these two charts. And uh, we have a so-called transition maps map between charts, which uh, maps from this area here over to this area. So it relates your two coordinates. And uh, again, this is a commutative diagram. So this uh, transition map here is uh, just XA inverse XB. So going from here to here, uh, you're basically going into here via the inverse chart XA. And then via XB, you go over here. And that is a transition map. And um, these are also, of course, homeomorphisms since our charts are homeomorphisms. OK, so this is all I want to say about uh, topological manifolds. Um, but uh, yeah, we, if, if we consider topological manifolds, uh, then uh, we can look at topological invariants. Uh, but uh, we need to add more structure if, if we want to do more, like, uh, let's say, a smooth structure if we want to have uh, functions which we can differentiate on, on the manifold. Or uh, we could add a metric structure, and then we get Riemannian manifolds where we have a notion of distance defined. And uh, this is what we are going to look at next. So smooth manifolds. Um, yeah, to, to motivate uh, the definition of a smooth structure on a manifold, um, what I already said is uh, we want to differentiate some function, for instance, just a, a scalar field on the manifold, which is, is a function from the manifold M to uh, real numbers R. And then we want to uh, define somehow a way to, to uh, get, get a derivative on the manifold. And we know how to differentiate uh, functions from, from Euclidean spaces to the real numbers. This is well known. So uh, we put a differentiable structure here on, on the manifold, basically by defining the uh, differential or derivative of this function here via the uh, derivative of the pullback of this function to our chart. And this pullback here is this function here, which is just defined as going from your domain, from your chart codomain here uh, to the manifold. And then here you have your function, which maps you to R. And uh, we are going to look at um, yeah, differentiation of these functions to define differentials of uh, the functions on the manifold. Um, but of course, we have to look at, uh, so this, if, if, if your um, manifold is uh, globally topologically non-trivial, then uh, you have to uh, cover it with multiple charts. And then you have to guarantee that if you have two different charts, that the sense of differentiation you define via one chart and via the other chart are in some sense compatible. So we have to look at another map here. And then uh, we have another pullback. And we have this transition map here. 
and uh, we need to have this uh, consistency of our differentiation among these different charts. And um, yeah, you're saying that uh, these two charts are smoothly compatible if uh, the transition maps, these maps here, are smooth functions. And uh, we know what a smooth function between uh, subsets of Euclidean spaces are. And only if this is satisfied, then uh, your notion of uh, yeah, your, your notion of uh, differentiability or smoothness uh, on the manifold is, is well defined. Okay, so um, smooth structure is basically just a smooth atlas which you um, define on your manifold. On your manifold. So uh, we have an atlas, which, uh, if you remember, it was just a, a collection of uh, charts, which uh, cover the whole manifold. And uh, this is called a smooth or differentiable uh, atlas if uh, all the uh, transition maps between them are smooth or differentiable. And the smooth manifold is just a topological manifold with such a smooth atlas. Or uh, actually, to, to make it a bit more precise, you have to look at uh, some equivalence class of smooth atlases or some, something which is called a complete smooth atlas. Or I think it's called something like this, maximal atlas, I think. All right, and uh, now we have uh, some notion of differentiability of functions from the atlas to uh, real numbers or also to vector spaces. But uh, we can also look at functions between two different manifolds, and then uh, they are called smooth if uh, you pull back this function uh, to coordinates, and then uh, you look at these coordinate expressions, and they should again be smooth. So we want to have the notion of smoothness of this map phi here going from the manifold M to the manifold N. What we're doing is we have a smooth structure, like a smooth atlas here and smooth charts here. Uh, so we map uh, this region in which we want to uh, define smoothness of this map down uh, to to uh, a region here in the uh, Euclidean space, and the same here. And then we can uh, pull back this function here into coordinates just by saying, okay, this map going along here is xm inverse phi and then xn. And uh, phi is smooth if uh, for all choices of charts, uh, these coordinate expressions which we pulled down are smooth. So now we have a notion of smoothness of functions between two different manifolds. And uh, yeah, I introduced this uh, to try to motivate tangent spaces, so how you would define them. Uh, the actual uh, definition is kind of abstract, so I'm, I'm just showing some pictures to motivate what's, what is going on. Uh, for that, we need uh, first a smooth curve, and the smooth uh, curve is just a smooth map from the real numbers to the manifold. Um, so you have here, like your, you, you could think about as a time of, of uh, a particle moving along some curve here. And uh, we are looking at a smooth uh, curve. So this gamma should be a smooth map. And uh, then we are looking at um, yeah, a specific kind of curves. So if we want to define the tangent space at the point P in the manifold, uh, we look at curves which go through the point P at time zero. And then uh, we are looking at um, the kind of derivatives of these points. So you can think uh, about this uh, curve here as, as uh, a particle moving along the manifold. And then uh, if you take the derivative, you can think about it as uh, something like a velocity vector going along here. And uh, it's a bit more technical to define it properly, but I guess uh, to get the intuition, this is uh, sufficient. And um, yeah, then these velocities at, like, like uh, the set of all velocities at this point P uh, is what spans the tangent space. So this is a way of how you can construct the tangent space at that point. And um, we have to look at, at uh, of course, multiple curves which go through this point uh, to spend the whole tangent space. So here we have a different uh, path and the different uh, tangent vector. And uh, if you have a faster parameterization, so you go faster, you have a higher velocity, and then you get a longer vector. And uh, yeah, the set of all of these vectors uh, corresponding to all these paths uh, would spend the tangent space. And uh, we actually have to, uh, in, in the Real definition, you have to look at equivalence classes since you could have uh, potentially different paths which give you the same tangent vector. So it's going to be a bit uh, more technical. But uh, yeah, the point I want to make is uh, you can define, uh, like the smoothness allows you to, to define uh, tangent spaces on your manifolds. And if you take the tangent spaces at all points uh, and take them together, they define the tangent bundle on the manifold. 
Okay, now I come to uh, reference frames. So um, the thing with tangent spaces is, uh, or, or usually if, if you're working with vector spaces, uh, you probably think about Rn. And uh, there you have a canonical basis given. So you can always write down vectors uh, as, as tuples of numbers uh, in, yeah, relative to, to the uh, canonical reference frame. But if you define such a tangent space, it's just an abstract vector space uh, without any particular choice of basis. And if we want to do numerical calculations, then uh, we have to um, choose some reference frame of our tangent space, some basis of this vector space. So we could choose this uh, red reference frame, and then the uh, coefficients of this uh, abstract vector in the tangent space relative to this red reference frame uh, would be just 1, 1. Or we could choose a different one, and we get square root 2, 0. And uh, you could look at the set of all possible reference frames of all tangent spaces, and that uh, gives you the tangent, uh, sorry, the frame bundle. And uh, if, if you are uh, studying um, differential geometry in the more classic way, then uh, usually the uh, reference frames uh, which you get are those which are induced by the charts. So of course, here on, on uh, R2, you have uh, a canonical frame field uh, given by the structure of this uh, Euclidean space. And uh, then you could uh, kind of, well, you, you get uh, coordinates also here. And um, this, this defines you reference frames, which are kind of the, the vectors which go along these uh, coordinate axes here, mapped over to the manifold. So if you have a chart, this induces you a certain frame field or choice of reference frames. But uh, you have to guarantee that whatever you're calculating here on your manifold is independent from that choice. And actually, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot represent uh, these like all possible frame fields which you could have as uh, frame fields which are induced by a chart. So um, I'm actually uh, in, in my research using a more general notion of, of frame fields than those which are uh, induced by charts. Okay, and then uh, diffeomorphisms uh, are um, yeah maps between two manifolds. So if you have a diffeomorphism. Uh, from a manifold M to a manifold N. Uh, this is a bijective map. And um, in such a way that uh, both uh, phi and phi inverse are smooth maps. And uh, this is the uh, type of isomorphism which you have uh, between uh, two smooth manifolds. So if uh, two smooth manifolds are diffeomorphic, they are structurally equivalent, uh, where structurally means um, like uh, respecting the, both the topology and the smooth structure which we defined. And um, yeah, so an example here would be uh, mapping, mapping this egg uh, to, the, uh, to the sphere. Uh, and uh, the diffeomorphism group um, is uh, of, of manifold. So the diffeomorphism group of manifold M is the set of all diffeomorphisms from M to itself. So um, this is kind of the uh, group of symmetries of uh, smooth manifolds. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, uh, you, you may wonder like why, why are these two uh, manifolds uh, isomorphic to each other or diffeomorphic? Uh, the reason is that we don't have a notion of distance. So uh, you're probably thinking uh, of, of these two as, as different manifolds uh, since you're thinking about some uh, metric on it and some distance. And if you have metric, uh, they are not equivalent, but as topo topological manifolds or smooth manifolds, uh, they are equivalent. So um, to, to uh, formalize this, we need to define notion of a distance or metric on the manifold. And um, yeah, the uh, Riemannian metric is actually a tensor field on the uh, manifold. and um, it is uh, kind of a smooth assignment of uh, positive definite inner products on the tangent spaces. So you have this uh, field eta, which uh, at the point P is just a map from TPM times TPM to the real numbers, um, which uh, satisfies that uh, if you put in uh, the same vector two times, uh, then you get a positive result out. This is the positive uh, definiteness. And um, yeah, it's, it's just an inner product on the tangent spaces. And uh, this defines you a norm of uh, tangent vectors. So we st still can't uh, define distances on the manifold, but we can just, uh, until now, measure lengths of uh, tangent vectors at each point. 
And uh, if we want to uh, measure the length of a curve on a manifold, um, we are basically doing this by um, integrating uh, the velocity vector. If we go along this path, um, and and yeah, the the norms of this uh, velocity vector. And uh, of course, if you are going faster, so if you reparameterize your curve such that you go twice as fast, you get a twice as long uh, vector. But um, also, your integration is uh, only half as long in time. So um, actually, you can show that uh, this definition is independent uh, from the parameterization of your curve. So this way, uh, you get from a notion of, of uh, metric on your tangent spaces to a notion of uh, lengths on your actual manifold. And uh, then we can finally uh, define distances between two points on the manifold. Um, as uh, the length of, or you could look at uh, the set of all possible paths uh, which connect uh, points P and Q, and then we look at uh, the shortest or the length of the shortest path. And uh, this is actually called a geodesic path. Geodesics are always the shortest paths uh, between two points. And uh, now that we have a notion of distance given on our manifold, uh, we can uh, define isometries which are uh, those diffeomorphisms, which are in addition uh, also preserving uh, lengths and distances. And uh, yeah, if, if you have uh, two Riemannian manifolds, M with a, a Riemannian metric eta M and N with eta N, then a diffeomorphism from M to M is an isometry if this technical condition here holds, uh, but it just means that uh, if you have, or for any two vectors uh, in the tangent space TPM on M, uh, you can do this push forward. You can kind of via phi push them to n. And uh, if this pushed forward inner product is the same as the inner product on your original manifold, then uh, this is an isometry. But uh, you, you can just think about it as, as uh, having some map which preserves distances. That's just the formal definition of it. And uh, then we can again uh, define the symmetry groups of uh, remaining manifolds, just how we did it with uh, smooth manifolds. There we had the diffeomorphism group. Uh, now we have the um, isometry group, which is the group of all uh, maps from M to itself, uh, where phi is an addition required to be an uh, isometry. And uh, if we look, for instance, at uh, this egg, then the set of isometries are the rotations around the z-axis and also reflections of the egg from left to right. Uh, and if you would look at uh, something like a homeomorphism or diffeomorphism, you could also uh, kind of uh, yeah, warp, warp like if you, you would have kind of a rubber egg uh, where you could squish it in a different way and, and kind of rotate this thing arbitrarily. Uh, but with isometries, uh, it's a more rigid geometry you're looking at. And uh, isometries are actually uh, preserving all the properties which are derived uh, from the metric structure on the manifold. So in particular, if you have uh, geodesics or curvature or the Levi-Civita connection in parallel transport, then uh, these uh, properties are preserved by uh, maps, by, by isometric uh, maps. And uh, now with this uh, metric uh, on our manifold, with this uh, Riemannian structure, uh, we can define all kinds of things like uh, connections, parallel transporters, and uh, geodesics and such stuff, which we'll do next. So uh, first, parallel transport. Um, yeah, the metric induces uh, a specific connection on the manifold. Uh, and the connection you can think of as uh, yeah, relating uh, neighboring tangent spaces uh, to each other and telling you how to, uh, in infinitesimal way, uh, transport vectors over the manifold. And um, then you get uh, finite parallel transporters along paths on the manifold by integrating this uh, local connection. So maybe this uh, example here is helpful. If you take, uh, if you have a vector here um, and you transport it along this path, you get this yellow vector here. If you take the same vector and transport it up here and then do down along this path, you get a different rotation of the vector. So you see that the parallel transport um, of, of yeah, vectors along different paths is now path dependent, while on the Euclidean space, uh, it's actually um, independent from the path you are choosing. And um, yeah, a parallel transporter is, is actually just an isomorphism between the tangent space here at the start point and uh, the tangent space at uh, the end point. And uh, this isomorphism, which maps uh, vectors from the start to the end point, is dependent on the path you are choosing. 
and uh, I, I have a slightly more uh, intuitive version. So usually, if, if you learn about um, differential geometry in the uh, yeah, differential setting, it's it's often a bit difficult to understand since you have all these infinites uh, infinitesimal uh, definitions. But uh, you can go to discrete differential geometry, and there everything suddenly becomes uh, very intuitive. So um, if you do parallel transport on a mesh, then how you transport from one phase of, of a mesh to another phase, uh, and these phases are flat spaces, you, you just do it by kind of uh, flapping up uh, these, these two things, and then you transport it over, and then you fold it back down. So it's a very natural notion of, of shifting stuff around on the manifold. OK, with that, uh, we can define curvature. Um, which is a quite abstract topic, uh, but I try to give an idea about what, what uh, curvature is on the manifold. And uh, the problem is that there are many different uh, types of curvature which are being defined. Um, but uh, maybe uh, we, we can start with the uh, intrinsic or Riemann curvature tensor on the manifold. Um, that is uh, defined as uh, basically taking a vector at some point and then rotating it in an infinitesimal circle. And if your manifold is flat, uh, this here is basically uh, yeah, just doing nothing. You transport a vector, it looks still the same. But if your space is curved, you will have an infinitesimal rotation there. So curvature is kind of me measuring um, what happens if, if you, you, you saw it before on this uh, sphere with like a, you had a big circle. And then uh, if, since the sphere is curved, you get a different rotation of the vector out there. Um, but if you want to have a local notion of curvature, you just do this infinitesimal circle, infinitesimal uh, transport in a circle, and then um, this defines your curvature tensor. And uh, this tensor has four indices, uh, which is quite uh, confusing probably if you don't know what they mean. But uh, two of these indices, like the last two here, for instance, mu and nu, just tell you in which direction are you rotating with your circle. Um, and the other two just, uh, they are matrix indices which tell you, okay, how does my vector change if I go in this mu and new direction? And uh, then if you have this uh, Riemann curvature tensor, which has these four indices, you can uh, compute uh, kind of averaged or index contracted versions of it. And um, yeah, for, for instance, uh, you get a Ricci tensor or a scalar curvature uh, and in two dimensions, uh, you also find something uh, which is a Gaussian curvature. And um, what, what I think is uh, important to understand is that everything I described until now is just the intrinsic curvature of the manifold. So um, if you have a manifold like, uh, let's say, the cylinder, you probably think about it as being embedded in R3. Like, this all looks like it's being embedded somewhere. Um, but uh, differential geometry can be done completely intrinsically. And these here are intrinsic uh, versions of curvature. But uh, you can also define the uh, curvature of an embedding, which is an extrinsic and a different notion of curvature. Um, yeah, so for instance, if we look at the scalar intrinsic curvature on, on such uh, manifolds down here, uh, we have that the uh, Euclidean space has a curvature of 0. Then uh, the cylinder also has a curvature of 0. Uh, spherical uh, manifolds have a positive curvature, and hyperbolic manifolds have a negative curvature. and uh, if you're confused why the cylinder, I mean, it looks kind of round, right? This, this looks curved to me. But uh, this is the embedding curvature. And um, the intrinsic curvature is flat uh, since, uh, or yeah, you, you can see this since uh, you can take a flat space. And then without tearing or warping the space, you can roll it up. And as long as you can do that without stretching your space, uh, you have, um, yeah, you, you don't affect this intrinsic curvature. It's just like, a curved embedding of a flat space. So this here is a flat space, but we can embed it in a curved way. And this is not the uh, curve, the intrinsic curvature we are referring to. And again, I have some examples from uh, discrete differential geometry. So if you look at the mesh, for instance, this icosahedron here, uh, you have only three different types of neighborhoods. Um, for instance, this red type of neighborhood, which is completely inside of a phase, then uh, this is obviously completely flat, right? It's just flat. And then you have these uh, neighborhoods here, which go over an edge. So you would have something like this here. But uh, this is still, it's intrinsically, it's a flat space, since we could unfold it without tearing the manifold. Um, and it's just uh, curved in the embedding space. 
And then you have these cusps here, these uh, blue things, and they are really intrinsically curved. And uh, you see that since you cannot flatten out that cusp without uh, stretching that thing or cutting it open at some edge. And uh, yeah, to flatten it out, we have to cut it open. And uh, for the icosahedron, you get this angle defect, which is this angle by which uh, this cusp is spread after cutting. Uh, and this is 2 pi over 6. And uh, this is kind of a discrete notion of curvature at that uh, vertex. And uh, you can see that again, since um, if you take some vector here and you uh, parallel transport once in a circle, which was our notion of intrinsic curvature, you go once around here. And then here we have to go back. But to do that, we have to close that 2 pi over 6 gap and then go back here, which uh, gives you some vector, which is in the end rotated by 2 pi over 6. So you see that always if you have this angle defect, um, if, if you have that an angle defect, uh, you will get the curvature or you get a different uh, rotation of your vector if you rotate once in a circle. So I find that uh, notion of, of discretized uh, geometry a bit easier to understand than the uh, smooth setting. And uh, if we look back at these examples here, um, yeah, of course, if, if we parallel transport in a circle on Euclidean space, then our vector won't be rotated in the end. And you have the same on a, a cylinder. If you go once, once up, then to the right, down, and back to the left on the cylinder, uh, your vector will also not be rotated. So it's intrinsically uh, a flat space. Um, and then a sphere, uh, you get by, well, you, you would have to cut out something. Uh, you have an, like this angle defect of 2 pi over 6, and then you have to close that gap. Uh, so that's a positively uh, curved space. And if you have such an hyperbolic space, you can again cut open, but instead of closing a gap, uh, you have to uh, spread it open. So you have actually more than 2 pi if you go in a circle here. So on flat space, uh, you have 2 pi in total if you go once in a circle. Uh, on a uh, positively curved space, you have less than 2 pi if you go once in a round. And uh, on a hyperbolic space, you actually have more space, which is why uh, like it kind of folds up at one side to the top, at the other side to the bottom. Yeah, and then uh, we have exponential and uh, logarithmic maps. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, exponential map at point P takes a tangent vector in TPM, so also at P, and uh, maps it down to the manifold. And um, yeah, you can just think about it as uh, taking this vector V, and then uh, you walk along a geodesic in the direction of V uh, for a length which is equal to the uh, norm of V. This is uh, the exponential map. And uh, it's, for instance, useful if, if you want to uh, do gradient descent on manifolds, since then uh, you have gradients, which are tangent vectors. Uh, but you want to do an update step by walking along this tangent vector. And you do this by applying the exponential map. So you map it down to the manifold, and uh, you get some point where you end up. And there you do your next gradient step. That's one example where this is useful. Um, and uh, Locally, this map is guaranteed to be injective, but uh, globally, it's not necessarily injective. So think about, uh, let's say, a sphere. If you start at the North Pole, um, then in some region, you will just uh, map down the tangent space uh, to, like, let's say, the Northern Hemisphere. But uh, if you go further, at some point, all the rays will come back and meet at the South Pole and then wrap multiple times around the sphere. So this map is not injective. Um, but in this region where it is injective, it's invertible. And uh, then the inverse on that region is called the logarithmic map, which just does the inverse. So it takes uh, a ten, a two points on the manifold, P and uh, some point Q, and then it maps back up to the tangent space and gives you that vector, uh, which would, if you apply the exponential map, would end at Q. OK, uh, some questions up to this point? Three minutes? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Then I will just uh, give an idea of fiber bundles. Um, yeah, to motivate fiber bundles, uh, we can look at uh, trivial bundles first, um, and then after that, look at non-trivial bundles. So um, globally, trivial bundles are kind of a product of uh, two spaces. Uh, e is called the total space, and then uh, we have a base space, M, like our manifold, and then we have a fiber, which we attach to each point. And uh, for instance, you could build R3 as uh, a direct product of having R2 as your base space. And at each point, you attach a fiber R1 by sticking it there. And what you get out is R3. Um, and you could also build a cylinder by taking S1 
and then gluing an interval to each point. So a cylinder is S1 times uh, this interval. And um, if you have such a globally uh, trivial bundle, you can uh, actually look at uh, local neighborhoods on your base space. And uh, then also here on this base space, uh, it's something trivial. So if you have here a neighborhood U, then on this neighborhood, you get the locally, yeah, a local subset, which is just U times R1. Or here on the cylinder, you could uh, split up the cylinder in this, uh, or this circle uh, in an upper part of the circle and a lower part of the circle. And then uh, you could attach fibers here to the upper and the lower part. Why would you do this? Uh, since if you have non-trivial bundles, uh, you do the same. So uh, yeah, if, if we have the Möbius strip, uh, we still have a circle as a base space, and we still attach fibers. Uh, but we glue these fibers together in a non-trivial way, such that uh, what comes out is not the product of these two things. So it's not a cylinder. But uh, you see, we, we kind of take here the upper part of the circle, and we take the lower part, and we glue these fibers to it. But then at one end, we uh, glue these fibers together in the same way. So plus one to plus one, minus one to minus one. But at the other end, we glue plus one to minus one. And then we get this twist. So uh, we, we can get these non-trivial bundles by uh, having like this uh, local, um, yeah, having, having, having uh, locally trivial structures. So locally, they look like products. But then globally, they are glued together in a complicated way. And uh, yes, I guess I will uh, still give two slides. And then uh, you know what, what a fiber bundle is. Um, yeah, fiber bundle is a structure which has uh, basically this, this total space E, uh, then the uh, base space M and the fiber, and these are all topological spaces. And uh, then in addition, we have a continuous subjective bundle projection map, which goes from the total space to the base space. And um, it has to satisfy this, what, what I call uh, local triviality, that locally we can uh, look at this bundle and then say, okay, locally it looks like... Um, it looks like a trivial product. So um, yeah, around every P, you find the neighborhood of your base space. So our base space here is a circle. And then neighborhoods are this upper and this lower part. And uh, we find a homeomorphism from this pre-image of U. So this would be here, um, if, if we have UA, uh, this is the upper part. The pre-image of pi is uh, this whole orange part of this uh, Möbius strip. Um, and that is mapped by Psi A to a direct product of UA, the part, the neighborhood of your base space, and the fiber. And uh, also, like on, on the lower part, we get uh, this thing here. And uh, if, if we can take this space and separate it locally into products, but not necessarily globally, then it's called a fiber bundle. And this is what this uh, commutative diagram here shows. So um, this homeomorphism has to satisfy that. Uh, so if you go from pi, from the pre-image from U, which is this upper part here in the Möbius strip, if you trivialize it to a local product space, then uh, you want that if you project down here on the first factor, so if you just take your point in the uh, in, in U, in your local trivialization, uh, this projection on the first factor should uh, should agree with the uh, projection of your bundle, of your bundle itself, um, which just means uh, these fibers over a certain point here in the base space are identified in the correct way. And um, this is important since uh, if, if we, uh, well, on, only this here is necessary uh, to define a fiber bundle that you can write it locally as a product. But if you have these uh, local trivializations and you want to recover the global topological structure from these uh, local trivializations, um, then uh, you need an atlas again of your base space, which covers the whole manifold or your whole base space. And um, you get uh, transition maps uh, between these local trivializations, which glue this together in the right way. And uh, yeah, what you're looking at here, if you look at this commutative diagram, this bottom right part is just what you saw before. It's just this local trivialization. Um, on UB, actually, Psi B is defined on UB. Uh, but to the left, we have a trivialization on UA. And uh, if we want to look at both simult simultaneously, we look at the overlap, where we can define transition map. And uh, so we're looking here at UA uh, intersected with UB and the pre-image of it, and on the left and right, the trivialization. And uh, then this defines us this upper arrow here, which uh, maps from one trivialization to the other trivialization. And this is kind of here on the very right, how you would glue these fibers together. So in the Möbius strip, you have on one side 
uh, you, you have a gluing of the fibers, uh, which is, is like uh, without a reflection, you just glue them together. And on the other side, this transition map uh, would have a reflection of the fibers. So um, yeah, the global topological structure uh, is encoded in the transition maps between different trivializations. This is what I want to say here. And um, yeah, if, if you would have a cylinder, then at the two ends, uh, you would just uh, identify in the these in the, the same direction. And if you have a movie strip, you have this reflection. And uh, this this additional reflection which you have in there is actually called the structure group of the bundle. And this uh, tells you a lot about the uh, topological structure of the bundle. So on a movie strip, you cannot find the trivialization which has a yeah which or an atlas of trivializations without this uh, twist somewhere. So your structure group will always have a reflection. Uh, while on, on the cylinder, you can choose a trivialization without a reflection. And uh, it has a trivial structure group. Um, and that makes it a globally trivial bundle. And uh, just, yeah. Is the structure group always the same for any uh, uh, atlas? Um, so one given atlas has uh, one structure group on it, yeah. So the. But, but, but you can have different atlases with different structure groups. Um, yes, you can have different atlases with uh, different structure groups, uh, but um, it's topologically uh, constrained how far you can reduce your structure group. Okay. So you you could have an. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you could have. Uh, an atlas with reflections on your cylinder if you want to, but you can reduce it uh, to a trivial atlas. Uh, while on the Möbius strip, it's topologically impossible to do this since you have this twist in there. So it, yeah, the important point is how far can you reduce your structure group? And uh, yeah, I already showed this picture of uh, the tangent bundle. And uh, yeah, the frame bundle you also already saw. So I guess I will stop here since uh, Pim still wants to go on. Thank you.